Now, what's God's opinion about oppression? Okay. And Luke 4.18, I came to send the oppressed into liberty. God speaks about oppression 84 times in Scripture. Do you know that that's the equivalent of how many times he speaks about sexual impurity, fornication, and, and adultery all together? You surprised by that? Many people are. But to him, oppression is a bigger deal. And the one most important fact to know about oppression is God is always against it. It is never okay with God for one person to misuse or mistreat another person. Now, depending on the English translation that you use, the English word abuse is used four to six times in Scripture. So the NASB uses it six times. All three times that you see it in the New Testament are all in reference to when Jesus is hanging on the cross and they were abusing him, saying, if you're the Son of God, save yourself. Okay? So that right there is a non-physical maltreatment called abuse. What? I can't even tell you how many pastors and Bible teachers I say that to, and they, that's the first time they've ever put those two things together. Twice in the Old Testament, we see the, the, the uh, abuse used, and it's regarding a king who's worried about being taken alive by a victorious enemy and being abused. You've got Saul in 1 Chronicles 10 and King Zedekiah in Jeremiah 38. The one other time you find the English word abuse in Scripture is in the Old Testament in Judges 19.25. And this is the account of the Levites' concubine being gang raped all night long. Okay, Well, that's a pretty significant... But think about abuse. The word abuse is used in both contexts. In other translations where other words are rendered abuse in English... The reference is almost always to non-physical maltreatment. Uh, There's a great deal that God has to say about oppression, and he is always, 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 always against it. The problem is that many of us, pastors, elders included, have a difficult time seeing what can so clearly be seen in Scripture in this regard if you have the correct lenses to look through. It's what I call a clown nose. If you're standing at the right angle, it's as obvious as a clown nose. But if you're at the right angle, you can't even tell that the guy's wearing a clown nose. And that's the problem, is people are looking at it from the wrong angle, looking at it through the wrong lens. That's part of my mission, is to fix that. Or hopefully, God use me to help fix it. That's the reason I believe, and others believe, that this is the time right now for this book and this workshop. So let's take a a look for a minute at uh, our friend's... The scribes and the, oh, I forgot to. I was going to give you guys that. Okay, let's look again at our friends, the scribes and the Pharisees. As we read through Matthew twenty-three, God and Jesus's condemning language, as he chat. Jesus has just warned the people listening to him about the two-faced oppression habitually and systematically perpetrated against them by the scribes and the Pharisees, their leaders. In verses thirteen through thirty-six, Jesus repeatedly pulls back the veil on the duplicitousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, the oppressors. He makes clear with harsh, terrifying words of warning that what was going on on the inside was far different from what was going on on the outside. And if you find that, it'll say outside, outside in the book, and I just fixed it. I found the typo as I was going through fixing it. Um, more typos. I think they breed when nobody's looking. Um, Pay attention to this. This, What's going on on the inside is different than what's going on on the outside. It's precisely what goes on with emotional predators, domestic oppressors, domestic abusers, and oppressors and abusers of all kinds. Now, these men, these leaders, Jesus turns and says, Woe to you. Okay? What people... Sadly, people don't understand the significance of Jesus using those words. Woe is the most terrifying word in all of Scripture. It's Old Testament speak, prophets speak, for prepare for agonizing torment and doom. Okay? Woe to you. In the vernacular of today, it would be like Jesus pointing his finger at them. And I don't know any other way to do this. It was as if he's pointing his finger at them and saying, God damn you. Saying woe to you is exactly that equivalent. 
Okay? We have to understand the language that he's using. He's not speaking as a first century Jew. He's speaking as a prophet of the Most High and as God himself. So when he says, woe to you, you cannot get more condemning than that. This is God himself pointing his finger in, the, in their face and says, you are hell bound. You are hell bound. We have to understand how significant this is. This isn't, oh, life's going to suck for you. Oh, no, no. Your eternity is going to stink. Your exit interview is going to be real smoky. When we look at the hypocritical attitudes and behaviors laid out in this whole section, we recognize that not only are these the same tactics exploited by the domestic oppressors in Hyde in our churches today, but also that Jesus is just as condemning today of evildoers like these as he was then. To him, you're the same. If you are an oppressor, you're the same. I know that seems hard to hear, but we have to hear it. Hopefully, when, when, I have that, when I have that kind of conversation with oppressors, hopefully God is able to use it to prick their conscience and bring them to a place of repentance. Now, in the, in the book, I lay out each one of the woes, and I describe what is... What is I can't go into it today. We don't have the time. <clears throat> but you can buy it on Kindle, too. So, um, so I want to talk about two key words. One is malice, okay? There are two Greek words translated malice in the New Testament. Poineria and kakia. Now, I'm going to give you two verses that help understand the significance of this word malice. The first one is um, Matthew 22:18. But Jesus perceived their malice, poineria, and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? But then in Colossians 3.18, the Apostle Paul says, um, But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, kakia, slander and abusive speech from your mouth. What's interesting is when you talk about abusive speech, talk about slander, when you talk about um, words like that, he's talking about people who are verbally abusive. That's part of the problem when we look at some of the English words that are taken from the, the Greek in the, in the New Testament is we're not able to capture... Okay, one of the, one of the difficulties... I'm going to sidetrack. I can't help myself. One of the frustrating things and one of the difficulties is whenever you're looking at an English translation, you're looking at an interpretation. And so most translating committees... And I know people that have served on translation committees for NIV through the net... And when you talk to them and they talk about the, their translation, their philosophy of translation, um, their primary goal generally is to be as technically accurate as they can. So <clears throat> there's two principles in interpretation in, in translation, and that's ipsissima verba and ipsissima vox. Ipsissima verba is the very word. Ipsissima vox is the very voice. Well, very often, what we run into is they're really good at capturing the word, but they miss the voice sometimes. Okay, So that's one of the reasons why the net does a good job sometimes of bridging that gap. The NIV does sometimes. Uh, Holman does a good job. The old Holman, before they made some changes that I think are a bad idea. Anyway, <clears throat> um, and I could give you lots of examples, but it's really important to understand what's the voice that this is being said with. That's why when I talk about woe to you, I'm trying to help you capture the voice, not just the words. Because the words by themselves can be flat. But if you hear the voice, it's like um, if, if, if I'm sitting in front of a counselor, I can use four words and, and I can communicate four distinctly different things. I didn't hit her. I didn't hit her. I didn't hit her. And I didn't hit her. The emphasis, the voice, changes the meaning of that sentence every single time, doesn't it? So voice is critical in communication. Not just the words, it's how it's said. And anybody that tells you that tone of voice doesn't matter, there's counseling for that. 
<laughs> so when we take together, these two words for malice describe a heart of evil intent. They describe a person who is not ashamed to deliberately violate either the law of God or his own or God's moral code and to feel justified and entitled to do it. Porneria sometimes is translated wickedness, which is evil intent, a mind disposed toward evil and wickedness. Okay? A kakia is to intentionally and purposefully do that which is evil and without justification. So when he's talking about malice, that's a huge word. The other word I want to talk about is treachery. <clears throat> a reason I want to talk about this is an Old Testament word. Um, and the, the, the Hebrew word, bagat, it, it, it's cognates, treacherous, treacherously, capture a similar uh, ex, uh, concept as malice does in the New Testament. Um, of the 55 or so times we see this word used, it always carries with it a sure sense of deviousness and betrayal. Okay? Uh, in the context of behind the veil, the most applicable use of the word bagad is found in the, fi- uh, the five times we see it in Malachi chapter 2, especially verse 14. It says, I don't know, do I have a... I do. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. There's a whole other teaching that we do on that. But we have to understand that it's right here that God, through the prophet Malachi, issues a scathing rebuke to the men of Israel who've been dealing with their wives, the women they have covenanted with to love, honor, cherish, and remain faithful to. They've been treating them underhandedly, deceitfully, disloyally, and unfaithfully, treacherously. So, in the as you go through go through uh, behind the veil, um, you'll find that this is an apt description of of how domestic oppressors maliciously mistreat their victims, especially the spouses, in our day and time, day in and day out. So let let me summarize some of the main ideas from this chapter. So um, first, oppression is never okay with God. Have you guys got that yet? (laughs) It is a big deal to him, so much so that he speaks against it 84 times in Scripture. In fact, Jesus himself said he came to set the oppressed free. And when you take a look at several passages in Scripture, and this is in the book, so I'm not going to lay it all out. It takes too much time. God requires his under-shepherds, to aid and protect the vulnerable and to confront those who are abusive and oppressive. Ezekiel 34 is probably the best section of Scripture to look at. He nails the under-shepherds hard in that. Um, Second, God condemns and declares righteous judgment on those who oppress and abuse. Third, God condemns abusive leaders and commends servant leadership. Remember, Authentic biblical leadership is servant leadership. It's for the good of those being led, not for the good of the one being led or the one doing the leading. Um, Fourth, when anyone, pastor or not, harms another as a result of their sin, Jesus commands that that person is to be admonished and required to repent. It's not an option if you're part of the body of Christ. If they refuse to do so, they are to be placed outside the fellowship and tell such time as true repentance and fruit in keeping with repentance has resulted. Take a look at Matthew 18, 15 through 17, and then 1 Corinthians 5, especially verse 11. If any so-called brother does all these... You know what verbal abuse is in, in, listed under that? It's not just sexual infidelity or sexual sin. There's a whole list in there. And nobody wants to pay attention to that those details. Because you know what? Everybody's going to fall short to some degree, right? Well, you know what? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to feel that guilty, so I'm not going to make you feel that guilty. Sorry, guys, it's the wrong approach to take. But that's what we see often. Well, you know, we all, all can be that way. Well, that's okay. All of us have the potential to be, to be murderers or rapists or thieves or whatever. So we'll just say it's okay because we all have that. That's stupid, right? Proverbs Proverb uses stupid. I can use it. <laughs> The fifth point is <clears throat> the malicious treachery driving oppression and abuse is diametrically opposed to the purpose and objective of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul gives us a summary statement in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 that the gospel is God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's the heart of the gospel. Oppression and abuse, there's no reconciliation. 
It's exactly the opposite. <clears throat> the gospel's thrust is to reconcile humankind to God and to exact justice on the wicked, the malicious, for oppressing and dealing treacherously with those who are his. And again, in the book, there's passages that support each one of these to look at. So, uh, let's move on. Chapter 4 um, is hiding in plain sight the banality of evil. In other words, the unobviousness. And I love that, the banality of evil. It's actually a title of a book. Uh, a gal who um, studied the Nuremberg trials of the Nazi war criminals. And she look, she's looking at Goring and all these guys, and she says, these guys look like janitors, school teachers, bus drivers, accountants. They don't look like people who could perpetrate this kind of wickedness and evil. But they were. It wasn't obvious. Right? So, domestic oppressors look like everyone else. They are so... There, there are no specific physical, economic, ethnic, social, vocational, or other obvious indicators. And being an oppressor is not gender-specific. The greatest majority of domestic oppressors are male. There's been a steady rise in the number of women who are also domestic oppressors. Oppressors hold respectable positions in companies, organizations, churches, and society at large. They can be as hardworking and appear as benevolent as non-oppressors. In fact, one of the favorite places for oppressors to hide in plain sight is inside conservative churches. That's their favorite place. The Apostle Paul recorded in Acts 20, 29 through 30, a warning to the church leaders of the church at Ephesus. He said, I know that after I am gone, fierce wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. Listen to this. Even from among your own group, men will arise, teaching perversions of the truth to draw the disciples away after them. To draw them after them. It's about me. It's not about what I'm teaching. It's about me as the teacher. It's really a subtle shift. Really a subtle shift. And that's the problem with this. It's so subtle. It's so subtle. But you don't have to be off very far before uh, the further you get out, the further away from true you are. Um, I use an example of uh, Korean Airline Flight 007. I think it's 83, took off from Anchorage International Airport, headed for Seoul, South Korea. There are three uh, electronic beacons that the internal navigation system is supposed to line up. Well, the third one wasn't, wasn't on. So that third uh, uh, calibration never took place. So they're flying on automatic pilot, internal navigation system across the Pacific Ocean. Well, they're, they're getting near land, and their navigation system says they're getting near Korea. Next thing you know, they've got a, MiG, a Russian MiG fighter on each wing. And they're being told to they turn, it'll be shot down. Well, the pilot is arguing and won't do it they got blown out of the sky. And there was a sitting U.S. senator on that craft, when, aircraft when it got shot down. A year and a half later, we got the black box back, and that's when they discovered that that one little tiny bad calibration sent that air, aircraft, because the internal navigation system said they were on the right path, but it sent it too far north. And because the pilot wouldn't pay attention to the corrective instructions... It costs the lives of, I want to say, 153 people. So it doesn't take being wrong very much for, for uh, over a period of time before destruction results. Okay. So there's a phrase to note here. Even from among your own group, men will arise. The wolves look just like the non-wolves. That's why the phrase wolves in sheep's clothing that Jesus uses in Matthew 7 what do wolves in sheep's clothing look like? Sheep. They don't look like wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. Because <laughs> the, the, the things you see, you know, you got the sheep and it's got the wolf face. Sorry, that's not a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's not obvious. That's the point. Okay. Um, behaviors are the only clear indicators of someone being an oppressor, yet... As we saw in the scriptures before, we looked at before, oppressors are adept at hiding in plain sight. And as, and as there's a scenario with Stephen and Erica in the book, 
They're really excellent at keeping their predatory oppressiveness concealed behind a public avatar of good. They do. They create this avatar, this image that's not really them. They say, this is what people will like and approve of, so that's what I'm going to present. That's not who I am. But they manufacture this. But they can't maintain it forever. So guess what? When you get home, you put the avatar away and who you really are shows up. Okay? The very fact that churches promote biblical va- values, such as loving one's neighbor, forgiving and living at peace with one another, can make churches unwitting breeding grounds for clever oppressors. Matter of fact, oppressors will look for a, a potential victim who is gentle and empathetic and doesn't challenge, doesn't get angry. They're looking for somebody who is soft. That's a tasty morsel to a domestic oppressor, to an to a emotional predator. That's yummy. Left unchallenged by church authority, oppressors hone their skills of concealing oppressive behaviors behind generosity, charitable service, mouthing all the right Christian catchphrases, and being in the public eye, preaching, teaching, worship, you name it. And usually, the more more public the image, the more exalted they are in, in, in their position, the more it fuels their ego. And it more it fuels their sense of entitlement to be worshipped and adored. The sad reality is not a rare exception, but instead is rather commonplace in American churches today. In fact, the more conservative the church or denomination, the easier it is for domestic oppressors to find a home and get away with their evil. Chapter 5, we talk about it in depth. We talk about uh, this disturbing correlation between the hyper-headship patriarchy view of male headship, male leadership in the home, and domestic oppression, domestic abuse, and sexual abuse. In fact, uh, this is such a key issue in the counseling that we do in our counseling ministry that Chapter 5 speaks specifically to the phenomenon of hyper-headship and all of that. Um, Headship is not a, is a biblical idea, but the way it's been distorted and misused, it doesn't look anything like God intended it to. Um, and what's interesting is about the people that have perpetrated that stuff and extended it, no training in hermeneutics, no training in biblical languages, but with poor hermeneutics, lousy logic, and an over-extrapolation as principle. Well, there's a principle, there's a principle, there's a principle. That right there is not the Word of God. A principle is not the Word of God. And that's what you see over and over and over and over. The Word of God gets so diluted that its principles become what's governing. Oh, wait a minute. Doesn't that sound like the traditions of men that Jesus gets after the Pharisees about? Do you see the parallels? Sorry, i get side. I got to put my glasses on. <laughs> um, one of the young ladies God brought to me for counseling a few years ago grew up in an ultra-conservative denomination. Not just one, many, but one in particular. Um, and that denomination is very much in the news, news reports in the last year. Um, um, because th- all of a sudden we have reports of hundreds of cases of oppression and abuse that were unaddressed for decades. And like everybody's walking around like, oh, I had no idea this was going on. <laughs> Pay attention. Well, no, you, your whole system is designed to uh, as, as a, a, a Petri dish for this. Now, She's experienced a great deal of healing so far, but the toxic shame that resulted from how she grew up still rises up and tries to take over once in a while. It's in that background. It's kind of like um, it's like eating garlic. Eat garlic Monday morning. Ch- chocolate pudding on Thursday still tastes like garlic, doesn't it? That's what toxic shame does. I, I liken toxic shame to emotional HIV. If you know how HIV works, the, the virus gets into the body, has RNA but no DNA, and it drills down into the T cell, the advanced guard of the immune system, and extracts DNA from the T cell. So it's, the T cells, are, the immune system is going, who are you, what are you doing? Nobody, I'm just like you. <laughs> oh, there's that soul vampire, right? And then, then it hijacks the entire immune system, actually going against and attacking. That's what toxic shame does. It hijacks absolutely every aspect of a person's humanity. Thoughts, emotions, perceptions, everything. Um, I'm going to skip that. Oppressors hold respectable position. I already said that, right? Okay. So, 
so let's talk a little bit about this, all right? Authority and leadership. When you hear the word authority spoken from a pulpit or in your home, what thoughts come to your mind and what emotions do you experience? What about the phrases authority in the home or leadership in the home? A lot of people have a negative reaction to that. This is a, there is a pervasively gross and confused misunderstanding about authority, what it is, who has it, and how it's to be used, especially in Christian circles, churches. This confusion and misunderstanding have been magnificent contributors to the domestic oppression we see prevalent in Christian homes and churches. It just is incredible. Um, there's a well-known paradigm for all of this, but hyperheadship really is a catchphrase for what we've been describing as domestic oppression throughout our time together. And it isn't relegated to just the church. It is, it's just that within the church, Scripture is twisted and uses a weapon by which oppressors oppress. It's really said, this is God's will for you. This is God's will for you. And even after they're confronted, well, God can use it. Are you kidding me? Well, uh, I guess I take a stick and start smacking your head and God can use that, right? I mean, come on. That just doesn't make sense. But people will go, oh, yeah, God can use that. Well, knock it off. It's not okay with God. Okay? Sorry, I've got to put my glasses on. <laughs> um, perhaps one of the most dynamic definitions from, from within is one by Jason Meyer, who took over for John Pap- Piper as pastor for preaching and vision at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis. This is what he says. And if you look on it, you can find it on their site or you can find it on my blog too. Hyperheadship is a satanic distortion, I love that phrase, of male leadership. But it can fly under the radar of, le- of discernment because it is disguised as strong male leadership. Make no mistake, it is harsh, harsh, oppressive, and controlling. In other words, hyperheadship becomes a breeding ground for domestic abuse. That's all I'm going to say on it. There's a whole chapter on it. There's a lot of research you can do on it. The problem is it's being perpetrated and, and, um, in certain movements um, within Christendom that are just, it, it really, you end up with, it, primarily in areas where you have what we call narcissistic family systems, where the image of the family matters more than the individual members of the family. Anybody familiar with that kind of a situation, right? And so, if, if that's the case, if, if the, the, the image of the family is more important than the individual members of the family, well, guess what? We do that with marriage, too. We say, well, marriage is more important than the people in it. So what did Jesus say to the scribes and Pharisees about how, what they did with the Sabbath? We do the same thing. We do the same thing with, with leadership and authority and marriage. We say they're more important than the people involved in it. I'm sorry, that's not God's economy. That is not God's economy. If that's your view, read the book. Read my book. Read, read God's book. Read, um, uh, what's his name? Um, shoot, he's from Tillamook. Um, Jeff Crippen, right? Um, um, Cry for Justice, Unholy Shrade. Excellent books, excellent books. Um, Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about authority and leadership, a biblical paradigm. Words matter. One of the things that go, that's a key part of that is it's usually the small words that matter most. Okay? Who's your authority? Who's the authority in your life? According to Scripture, Jesus Christ is. But according to people, they are. Here's the misunderstanding. The word all means what? What does it leave out? So when Jesus says in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me, what does that leave out? In Ephesians 1, where God placed all things under his feet, What does that leave out? So the only real authority belongs to Jesus Christ. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ. What Jesus does is he delegates stewardship of that authority to different roles. So I have no authority. I serve in roles 
where I steward the authority of that position for Christ. But I have no authority. That word have has got to go away. All authority, the only one who has authority is Jesus Christ. If I'm the mayor, I exercise the authority of the office of mayor. Right? But when I'm not the mayor, guess what? That authority isn't accessible to me. I work in law enforcement. When I'm no longer a police officer, I can't pull your car over if you're speeding. Not legitimately, right? So this idea that I have authority, or this person is, is, has authority. No, you're in a position of authority. The authority belongs to the position in Jesus Christ, not to you. That one simple misunderstanding is at the root of most of what we see in domestic oppression and abuse within the body of Christ. That one little word. I mean, it would be like it would be like the monks discovering that the word was celebrate, not celibate, right? One R is missing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> the joke around is you have to. I have to treat my mind like a bad neighborhood and not go there alone. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so let's look, let's touch on chapter 6, how they pull it off. This is a really long chapter. I talk about tactics and systems of oppressors. Um, this is warfare. These are warriors. Warriors of evil. Warriors of Satan. This is demonic. And if you take a look at the task, tactics and strategies and systems that they employ, it looks like a military campaign. I have experience in that. So when, I'm, when I sit and start laying this stuff out, looking at this stuff, I'm like, this is, this is like a military campaign. Tactics, strategies. It's incredible. Um, there's a lot I could say about this, but what happens is in order to feed their emotional predation, oppressors have to ensure ready access to the soul and emotions of at least one other person. This person will usually be their key romantic interest at the moment and eventually will be their spouse. Now, while the oppressor may not be a full-blown diagnosable narcissist, there's a great deal of narcissism driving all emotional predation, including domestic oppression. All emotional and sexual predators groom their victims, setting them up to be systematically and repeatedly victimized. There's a narcissistic bent to this and there, that, that is dark and malevolent in its purpose, but it's camouflaged as the very opposite. See, the goal is to establish an emotional connection, develop trust, create a dependency by the victim on the oppressor to the point the victim cannot imagine not remaining in the relationship. I know that's resonating with some of you, right? There, now, there are a variety of, of very calculated grooming tactics that these predators use, each one oppressive and abusive in its own right. So you have a system of oppression. These tactics become strengthened and intensified into full-fledged control systems of oppression and abuse. I'm pra- painting a pretty dark picture, right? I hope so. So here's an important note. Emotional predators and domestic oppressors and abusers operate along a continuum of predatory attitudes and behaviors. No two oppressors are exactly alike. What I try in this chapter to do is lay out uh, in comprehensive detail what these evildoers have most in common with each other along that continuum. There are things that aren't mentioned that in certain situations would be considered to be basic. What I've tried to do is I've tried, okay, this is the, this is the, um, the, the most, this is the alphabet, if you will. Um, no diphthongs or anything, right? Um, so let's take a look at some of these. Oh, hang on a second. So somebody bounced out and then back in. All right. Oh, sorry. That won't look good on your resume. All right, so let's talk about it. The first one we want to talk about is selecting. So an oppressor seeks someone who's vulnerable and preyable, P-R-E-Y. Someone they can prey on. Someone who suits the oppressor's appetites 
They do this by watching and waiting, gathering information, seeking to find who will be the most susceptible to their ploys and most likely to satisfy the emotional predator's gluttonous appetites. Some people like sweet, some like savory. My wife is jalapeno, I'm white chocolate macadamia. Right? We have different tastes. Emotional predators have different tastes. Next is targeting. Oppressors zero in on the emotional morsel that they've selected. They start circling in, initiating an or increasing connection, testing the target's vulnerability to ensure they have selected well. When we talk about boundary testing, I um, remember a gal talking about being in a, at a, an event. She was uh, part of the uh, support system for this event. And there was, a, there was a, another fellow that was serving in the same role. And he... He'd come over and talk to her, you know, kind of noisy in the background, come over and talk to her. And, and then he'd, he'd put his hand down and he'd kind of lean over on one leg and the back of his hand would touch her thigh on the outside. That's a boundary test. That is a boundary test. And when she mentioned it and I said, no, that's a boundary test. She goes, what? Well, over the next three weeks... It was more and more and more. And she said, I realized, she said, how did you know that? I said, it's just common. But that's, that's part of the targeting. And they'll test. They'll see what they can get away with. And when they can't really get too much pushback, they move on to the next. Because they've got many in the, in, the, in, the, in the pipeline. There's a lot of intent behind this. Okay. Then we talk about gaining trust. As the oppressor and the target connect and a relationship develops, the oppressor camouflage, camouflages and conceals who they really are and what they're really like. Instead of showing who they really are, they package themselves as someone safe and comfortable for, even desirable for their intended victim. He's so smart. He's so caring. He just, he just hears me out. We talk for hours. Anybody ever known like that in romance and then after marriage, it's like the guy's got three words in two weeks? Then we have filling and creating need. This is pernicious. So the, the two-sided, two-headed coin of this grooming process, if you will, is the oppressor's uncanny ability to home in on the deepest emotional needs of their target, meeting the need overwhelmingly. Nobody has ever understood me the way he does. Nobody f- makes me feel as cared for. Nobody gets me like he does. And it makes it seem to the target that what makes the most sense is for them to give themselves over. Oh, that's the next one. Sorry. So what this does is this creates a dependence on the relationship with the oppressor to ensure that these needs continue to be met. Then they draw them in. So the, the, the oppressor draws the target into closer relationship, deeper dependence on them, making it seem to the target that what makes the most sense is for them to give themselves over to the oppressor. They feel like they must. They simply must. And that circle gets tighter and the connection gets denser. And it has a gravity all of its own, almost like two planets. And then, now we have gaining control. So, as the oppressor gains more and more influence and more and more control over the target's thoughts and emotions, the target, now the victim, becomes bonded to the oppressor. It's become so much a part of their, their life, their thinking, um, they, they, every thought this person is, is involved in, every thought, every decision, there's an influence there. Over time, the victim becomes so bonded to the oppressor that they become enmeshed with the oppressor, not knowing where the one ends and the other begins. We see this with, with uh, sex trafficking survivors. It happens quickly, just quickly. Because they usually are coming from a background where no one's ever shown any regard for them, never affirmed them, never told them they were beautiful, never told them they were smart, never told them they mattered. So if you can make them feel, they don't really matter, but make them feel as if they matter, just that fast. Just that fast. And when you see it happening, it's horrifying. Anyway, um, so this is one-sided, though, because it's the victim, not the the oppressor who's getting the bond, okay? <clears throat> the victim becomes more and more under the control of the oppressor. The treatment of the victim becomes more and more victimizing and exploitative until the victim can't imagine not being in the relationship 
and will and you'll hear them say I never imagined I would I would allow anyone to talk to me that way or I never never imagined but you know what I know he loves me it's like insanity the hooks are in their soul and it's hard to get them loose but wait there's more so oppressors gain control by demeaning degrading shaming using threats and or violence or other methods on the negative side of the spectrum but then on the positive side of the spectrum they gain control through flattery mirroring oh that's my favorite too love flooding just like standing at the beach and all of a sudden that that one wave just goes okay. they love flood and then they withhold and so it's just like that oh the the wave went back out i can get back out in the water and then, just like that and sometimes intense sexual experiences and things like that okay um, and then they use coercion and manipulation of the primary tactics used to gain and then later maintain control of the victim. They don't control their own thoughts or emotions. They've been hijacked. Okay. <coughs> then the t- next tactic is isolating. The oppressor mentally, emotionally, and physically separates the victim from anyone or anything that would support the victim in realizing the truth and seeking to escape. Some of the methods used... Uh, we describe in, in a whole section in this chapter under control systems. They're pretty complicated. But we talk about manipulation and all that other kind of stuff. Manipulation is an animal all of its own. There's about 20 standard manipulation tactics. Um, I sat with a young man yesterday, and we are talking about his, his father, who's, and he's like, I said, okay, well, so we're talking about manipulation. We're talking about gaslighting. We're talking about blame shifting. We're talking about deflecting. And he was like, all this stuff. And he goes, so you describe, well, he does this. Well, I said, that's what this is. And so we, we, he left with a list of like eight manipulation tactics, and he was just blown away. But he says, thank you for this. No one's ever talked to this kid about the way his father's treating him is, is wrong. But he's his father, so he has to deal with it, right? And then, shaming and blaming. Oppressors shame their victims into submission, blaming them for everything that goes wrong, no matter who is really responsible. And there's a lot of shoulding. Shoulding equals shaming. Well, you should this, you should that. Shoulding starts from a position of judging, judging as having failed. You've already not measured up. Well, you should have this, you should have that. Okay? Do you know that God doesn't should us anywhere in Scripture? There's shalls and shall nots, but there's no shoulds. I know the first time I said this in a group, I said, you've got to stop shitting yourself. And everybody goes. <laughs> There's actually a chapter in one of, another book where we talk about shitting a great deal. We have to understand that what shitting is doing, about, is shitting is shifting the blame to the victim, making it clear that if only the victim will do what she should, everything will be as it's meant to be. Then there's, then there's maintaining control. The oppressor's tactics develop into more intricately complex strategies and systems of oppression. The victim is brainwashed into believing that this is what they deserve. This, this is their own fault that they're being treated this way. They can't survive without the relationship with the oppressor. I made my bed, now I've got to lie in it. Okay? And then there's repeating a cycle of oppression. That's a whole other system in itself. Okay, and you look at cycles of abuse. We, we've laid out cycle of oppression a little bit differently because there's factors where you don't have the violence, but there's other things that happen, manipulations and coercions and stuff like that. So that's going to bring us to a break. Uh, we'll do a quick Q&A. Hang on a second. Okay, so anybody streaming, if you have a question, shoot me a chat. Yes, sir. Uh, this isn't my objection, but it's one that I'm anticipating. Uh, time and time again in the New Testament, we are exhorted to live in a submissive way, uh, say, to government, even though the government does wrong. And so the objection that I'm anticipating, although, again, not my personal argument, but I'd like to know how you respond, uh, shouldn't a woman, even, in an, even if she is being... Absolutely not. I'm going to cut you off. Yeah, well, so, Absolutely. 
because you know what? Here's the problem. When it talks about submitting to this stuff, we, like in Peter and other places, he's talking to believers who are being subjected to these things by unbelievers. But if you take a look at how Scripture, especially the New Testament, addresses how things operate within the body of Christ, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because, matter of fact, if he's being oppressive, the leadership is mandated by God to step in and intervene and put a stop to it. Authority isn't, again, being... And it's, don't forget, the government, again, exercises the authority of whom? Jesus Christ. For what purpose? To punish evildoers. Whole different system of authority. Absolutely different than within the family structure or the church structure. Absolutely different. And see, and that's what happens. We end up with this thing called conflation. It's a logical fallacy. These two things have a connection, so they are the same. Again, it's a logical fallacy that you see all the time. It's a way to rationalize, justify, and defend that which is forbidden by God. It's really that simple. Oh, the woman you put here with me. Does that sound familiar? Oh, well, the serpent. And we all know that that left the serpent with not a leg to stand on. Yes, Jan. Initially, they do. Eventually, it becomes so, so. It's second nature. Okay. Do you? How many of you can brush your teeth without thinking about? How many you ladies can put on, or whoever can put on your makeup without having to think about it? Right. <clears throat> well, you never know anymore, right? Um, <clears throat> there's so many things that we repeat over and over and over that they become second nature. And that has to do with character traits. That has to do with patterns of behavior and relational dynamics. They become habituated. We don't have to think about them. Matter of fact, we have to be confronted about this unrighteousness in order to go, oh, yeah, I guess that isn't okay. I can't even tell you how many times people say, well, yeah, I guess that, I guess you're right. I guess that. They haven't really thought about it. They've gotten to the place where they don't think about these things any longer. But initially they do. Hang on a second. Go ahead, Matt. You... Okay. And so is, is that then maybe where the person, again, going back to Jody or I forget his question, um, how the oppressor, then if they grew up, having that as a pattern, it's just second nature. So okay. So if they grew up with that. Okay, I grew up in that environment. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't know how not to become my father. Okay. That's why I pursued psychology after I got out of the Marine Corps. You know what psychology did? Created more problems, more questions, greater confusion. So I did. And you'll, you'll, you'll see in the, in the book, I pursued Buddhism to psychiatry, psychology and everything in between. Um, okay. <clears throat> Good question. I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> um, so it was the most common thing. It's what I knew best. I didn't know how not to, but I hated it. That's often the difference. That's often the difference. Okay? So that, part of, I'll get back to you in a second, Matt. One of the questions here, can a true oppressor be born again? I believe true oppressors are so-called brothers. I believe they... Oh, thank you. They bear the name. It's, it's like, hey, I can wear a Rams uniform and have the playbook, but it doesn't mean I'm a Los Angeles Ram, does it? Because I'm not really on the team. I can sh- hang out at the practices. I may even go down around the field. But if I'm not actually engaged in the plays, if I'm not welcomed in by the coach, I'm not a member of the team, am I? So are, can they be truly bored again? Not at that point. I don't believe they are. Because what, what else? We're going to see this in a little bit. When we talk about fruit... What does Jesus say about good tree, bad tree? Good fruit, bad fruit. Pretty simple, right? A three-year-old can figure that out. God's math is pretty simple. I hope that answers the question. Matt, you had a question? That was, that was my exact question. How can a sociopath, basically, who's 
They really can't. They can't. They really can't. Tom. You um, you read about these women being not only affected but infected. Why is it they sometimes look like they're cooperating? Bec- okay, that's a really good question. It's what we call learning to cower quicker. Okay? She She's learned that pushing back does no good. It matter makes things worse. So she just doesn't push back. She doesn't fight back. She doesn't talk back. She just cooperates. Because it's easier. It's the only way to get some semblance of peace. Some, some um, uh, pause in the hostilities. What about with respect to the facade of the family? Well, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> because think about it. If you're in a church... Well, good Christian families don't look look like this. They don't look like yours. It's embarrassing. That's part of the shame. Well, I'm I'm part of this, so I'm as I'm responsible too. That see, toxic shame is where a person ends up taking on responsibility for somebody else's sin. Okay, and that's the factor that's at work in that. That help? Yeah. <clears throat> Hang on a second. This has got a text. We're going to take a break pretty soon. My dry audio dropped down significantly. Well, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I don't know what happened. Um, let me see what happened. I am not a Windows 10 fan, but I don't have the, the bandwidth to learn Apple. So pray for me. <laughs> I need deliverance from Windows 10. Uh, another question. Yeah, Robert? If you see you, that you're exhibiting signs of an oppressor. Right. So what do I do moving forward? Do I go to my pastor? How do I approach getting... Okay, that's a good question. So if I say, this sounds like me, what do I do? The first thing you do is you get on your face before God and say, Lord, I hate what I'm seeing. Okay? It's called repentance. Now, we have to remember that repentance is not change of mind. It's turning and going in the opposite direction a military or maneuver called to the rear march. They're moving in one direction and the whole unit turns and goes exactly the opposite direction. That's repentance. And we talk about repentance. <clears throat> the Bible talks often about fruit in keeping with repentance. The best example we have, Paul lays out in Ephesians 4.28. Let him who steals, steal no longer. But let him toil with his hands that he might have something to give those who are in need. So what he stopped doing this unrighteous behavior, replaced it with the opposite righteous behavior, does it consistently, regularly, over time. So now he's not only paying his way, paying off his old debt, now even his motivation for working hard has changed and it's to bless another. That's fruit in keeping with repentance. Okay? Now, you're going to need help. You're going to need to sit down with somebody who's going to be able to say, this is what repentance looks like. Okay? And walk you through that. There's biblical counselors. You get with a pastor. There's, you know, send me an email. We'll get you connected. Hang on a second. I got a bunch. Are you okay? Um, okay. <laughs> okay. It was an issue on my end. Now it's remedied. I'm glad. Does that help? Okay. Yes, Sandy. I uh, I think we have a key problem in churches where key problem in churches. Men are not standing up against it. Well, part of it is because um, they don't recognize what it is. And I think they also feel their own sense of, I also struggle with... Yeah, part of it is, I'm not going to hold you accountable, you don't hold me accountable, and we're all kumbaya. How do we break through that? You pray a lot, and you, you talk a lot. You, get, you just be loud. You know, Not abrasively loud, but you've got to be loud. You know, buy copies of the book and say, please read this. I'm serious. I would love to do a class at Western and at Multnomah. I'd love to do a class at Biola about this. I'm in Southern California. I'm bipolar. I'm north and south. Do you address um, like the use of the word like obey in reference to wives and children? I don't know if I do. I do a little bit in this. I, mostly what I talk about is the distortion. 
So, <clears throat> but one of the things that's really interesting is that when <laughs> everybody wants to go, especially about spiritual authority in the church, everybody wants to go to the Hebrews, but when you take a look at the gr- Greek, it's, it really is talking about be willing to be, pers- be, persu- be open to being persuaded by your leadership. Oh, see, words matter, huh? And and uh, whether it's in the first person or third person matters too. We'll talk about Malachi two seventeen another time. Um, hang on a second. Um, oh, I'm a little past my time. <coughs> I'm I really try to be good about time. Um, I'm not doing so good. Somebody else had a question over here. No, Jan. In Hebrews, where it talks about submitting the authority, okay. you know, those who are in authority over you in the church, it actually, when you look at the, at the Greek, it's talking about being open to being persuaded. You don't hear that language, do you? You look at the English, and that's what it means. It wasn't written in English, kids. It really wasn't. Paul did not carry an English translation in his briefcase. He didn't. I know some people feel like Oh, that's what it says. Okay, that's what it's translated to. And don't forget, translation is interpretation. Okay? So if, you don't, if you're not able to study and understand, you know what? There are a lot of people who have studied and understand the original languages. You can find a boatload of stuff. I've got resources galore. Yeah. Well, see, part of the problem is, it's like, you know, remember the game Telephone? Yeah. That's what we end up having. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, uh, we'll do this and we'll take a break. I'll give you an example. Um, several years ago, I heard a message about what was talking about Eye of the Needle being a special gate, and the camel had to get on its knees. Do you know there's no historical or, or archaeological evidence for any of that? <laughs> What's really interesting is that when you take a look at the Aramaic word for rope, it's one letter difference than the Greek word for camel. Or camel. That's, that's, isn't that amazing? Again, another one, another one I heard about the napkin. Well, you know, the reason it says that Jesus put his, the napkin off to the side is because when, a, when the, 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 the homeowner, the, 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 the landowner got up from the table, if he was coming back, he'd lay the napkin to the side. If he wasn't, he'd put it over. They didn't have napkins in the first century. See, so there's a whole lot of stuff out there that's perpetrated as Christ- Christian teaching that is more slogan and myth and legend than actual scripture. So, I know, I wreck everybody's party, don't I? Let's take a, like a 10-minute break. We'll come back. I'm not going to have time to get through all this, but we'll get as far as we can. <laughs> 